Good morning. This is Unit 5, Light and Sound. We're just getting started. We're on Lesson 2. So let's review just a tiny bit about what we have been learning about. Um, we've been learning about what light is and how it travels. Um, let's take a look. Listen to these and see if you can answer these riddles. I am an extraordinary kind of energy and I travel as tiny waves. I'm very fast, but you cannot see me moving. What am I? Light, that's right. I am a source of light. Light energy starts with me. Light waves move out from me and illuminate the area around me. Am I a shiny table or a silver watch or the sun? The sun, that's right. Am I the moon, a light bulb, or a mirror? A light bulb. If light waves move out from a source of light, uh, then we can name that source of light. <clears throat> Many things are a source of light. Light bulb, sun, fire, volcano, bioluminescence. Many things reflect that light. Okay, a shiny table reflects the light, a watch reflects the light, a mirror and the moon all reflect light. They're not a source of light. So be super careful that you listen to the question carefully. Okay, here's another one. I am formed in places where all of the light doesn't reach. Sometimes I'm very dark, sometimes only a little bit darker than what's around me. Sometimes I take the shape similar to something nearby. What am I? a shadow. I begin at a light source and travel through the air. Sometimes you can see me and sometimes you can't. I show the way light travels in a straight line. What am I? A ray. Sometimes in the fog, you can sort of see a light ray. You can see how straight the light is when the fog is moving and it and it just illuminates some of the fog near you. Or even um, dust clouds. If you see dust clouds, you can sometimes see rays in a very straight line. Or even through the clouds in the early morning or in the late afternoon when the sun's going down, you can see light rays traveling through clouds in a very, very straight line. Those are a ray. Okay. I am one of the characters in the story, and I'm especially knowledgeable about light. I love to paint. I always notice the qualities of the light and the shadows, and I'm slowly losing my own vision or sense of sight. Who am I? Samuel. Let's talk a little bit about the story elements that you're going to be hearing in this particular read aloud as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> listen to this. Jack, how about we go fishing tomorrow morning, asked Samuel. Sounds good to me, said Jack as he stood up to go. As you know, I am the better fisherman. It will be a miracle, Samuel Van Lumen, if you catch a single fish. Can you tell the difference between narration and dialogue in those sentences? Dialogue is the actual words that people are saying back and forth to one another, you will find dialogue, dialogue um, inside quotation marks. So, Jack, how about we go fishing tomorrow morning? Sounds good to me. As you know, I am the better fisherman. It will be a miracle, Samuel Van Lumen, if you catch a single fish. If all you read is the dialogue back and forth, you could make it a play. You could put their names somewhere um, and tell the characters what action they should do. But when we just have a story, you would have narration in between there to sort of tell you what the characters are doing. So, Jack, how about we go fishing tomorrow morning? That's the dialogue. And the narration is asked Samuel. So you know who it is that's saying it. Sounds good to me. And that is dialogue. And then it's, it, there are some words in between more dialogue. It says, 
said Jack as he stood up to go. So you can picture in your mind who is speaking and what he's doing. And then he finishes with dialogue. As you know, I am the better fisherman. It will be a miracle, Samuel, if you catch a single fish. Can you tell what point of view this story is being told from? This is a third person point of view. You heard about this point of view in The Wind in the Willows? When a story is being told in the third person, you're going to hear pronouns in the narration, especially like he, his, him, she, her, hers. Somebody else is talking about these people and what they are doing. That's third person. If we have a first person story, the main pronouns that you would hear would be I, my, mine, and me. So here's third person. Jack, how about we go fishing tomorrow morning, asked Samuel. Sounds good to me, said Jack as he stood up to go. Listen to this. Jack, how about we go fishing tomorrow morning, I asked. Ooh, do you see how that changes the perspective? All of a sudden, somebody else is telling the story. And that's what point of view is. So listen carefully to find out today about what light does when it hits an object. Hmm. The next morning, both men were up bright and early, each one looking forward to a day of fishing. Fishing had become one of their most cherished pastimes and they both enjoyed fishing for striped bass. They had a favorite fishing spot on the banks of the Hudson River, where Samuel arrived first. Okay, the Hudson River is in the United States, and it's the overall setting of our story. The setting is where and when a story takes place. The overall setting is in New York State and near New York City. There is an old rickety and wobbly pier jutting out onto the cool lapping water of the Hudson River. Nearby, a row of silver birch trees provided just the right amount of shade. There was also a picnic table. Alfie always accompanied them and frequently scared the fish away by jumping off the pier into the water. Hey, you beat me to it, shouted Jack as he walked towards Samuel. Samuel was already on the pier, intently focused on attracting a large juicy bloodworm, no, attaching a large juicy bloodworm to the hook on the end of his fishing line. Ew. Alfie was stretched out, enjoying the sun and the gentle breeze that was blowing across the Hudson River Valley. Just got here myself, yelled back Samuel. I hear the fish are jumping right onto the line. Well, they'll miss your line for sure, bellowed Jack, and then he laughed loudly to himself. Samuel smiled at his friend and shook his head. If you continue to yell like a wild bear, you'll scare away every living creature, including the fish, said Samuel. Ah, the fish can't hear me, retorted Jack. Sometimes when people begin to lose their hearing, they speak more loudly because they can't hear themselves very well either. That's why some people, especially people who are losing their hearing, speak loudly. For several minutes, the two men were silent. Samuel finished attaching the worm to the hook on the end of his line, and then he cast his line out into the smooth, glass-like surface of the Hudson River and plonked himself down on the edge of the pier. You know, Jack, said Samuel, the Hudson River is 306 miles long and begins in the Adirondack Mountains in a lake called the Tear of the Clouds. I did know that, replied Jack, as he too hooked the fish bait and cast his line out into the water. Then, sitting down beside Samuel, Jack said, Tell me something I don't know. For a long while, Samuel gazed out at the glistening river. His old eyes were admiring the view of the sunlight dancing across the water. Going back to what we were talking about yesterday about light waves, said Samuel. Did you know that when a light wave hits an object, three things can happen. 
Light can be transmitted or passed through an object. Light can be reflected or bounce back off that object. Or light can be absorbed or soaked up into it. This is determined by the type of object that the light wave hits. Sometimes the light does a combination of these things. Three important vocabulary words. Ding, 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 ding. Transmitted, reflected, absorbed. Hmm, Jack responded. Take reflection, for example, continued Samuel eagerly. Most of the light that reaches our eyes is reflected light. You see, apart from objects that produce their own light, such as the sun or a light bulb, all other objects are visible because light waves from a source bounce off them and into our eyes, explained Samuel. If you recall, Samuel Van Lumen, I did go to school. For most of the time, we were in the same class, said Jack, somewhat grumpily. I remember learning about bioluminescent creatures, such as lightning bugs. If I recall correctly, they produce their own light. Yes, exclaimed Samuel, laughing as he spoke. It seems that as my eyes begin to fail me, I appreciate even more the things that I am able to see. The science of light is really quite fascinating. I'm sure it is, shouted Jack. However, I hope you're not going to talk all day. That's why you never catch any fish, you know. <clears throat> so here is an example of items. T transmitting light, light passing through. Um, reflected light, light bounces off an object and comes back. Okay, we can see light being reflected because you can see these objects and light being absorbed. If light is absorbed, we see something as black. Hmm, very interesting. Samuel smiled at Jack and continued to talk anyway. You see, when light hits a surface, some of the light bounces off the surface. It's the light that bounces off the surface that we call reflected light. Most objects reflect some light. In fact, you're reflecting some light right now, Jack. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to see you, exclaimed Samuel. Not that my eyes let me see a whole lot these days, he added. Jack glanced over at Alfie, who was staring at his reflection in the still water. Jack laughed and said, look at the way the smooth water is reflecting a perfect image of Alfie, just like a mirror. At that moment, Jack stood up to check his line. Hmm, I thought I sent something nibbling, but there's nothing there, he said. When I was young, Samuel mused, I often wondered why we are able to see our reflection in some things, but not in others. Jack laughed. We wondered a lot of things when we were young. I still wonder some of those things. Do you remember, asked Samuel, when our third grade teacher, Mr. Benson, brought a mirror and a piece of wood to class to explain how light is reflected off a surface? <laughs> he showed us that when the surface of an object is perfectly smooth and shiny, like that of a mirror, light rays hit all parts of the surface of that object at the same angle. Therefore, light rays reflected by that object bounce back off it at the same angle and produce a clear and accurate reflection. Ah, I remember Mr. Benson well. However, Samuel continued, when the surface of an object is not perfectly smooth and shiny, like that of a piece of wood, light rays hit different parts of it at different angles. Therefore, some light rays are absorbed by that object and some are reflected by that object at different angles. So it does not produce a reflection. Mr. Benson was one of my favorite teachers, said Jack. Yep, he's one of my favorite teachers too, agreed Samuel. I remember him explaining that because they are so smooth, mirrors reflect almost all the light that hits them. Have you noticed that crazy dog of yours, Jack asked. He's still staring at his reflection in the smooth, shiny surface of the water. He does that, exclaimed Samuel. Both men laughed loudly. The sound of their laughter seemed to act as a trigger for Alfie. He looked at them, wagged his tail, 
and then jumped headlong into the river. Don't go too far out there, Alfie, yelled Samuel, as if he was talking to a young child. The two men stood up to check their lines and then returned to their chairs. Samuel continued to keep a watchful eye on Alfie, whose head was just visible above the water. He noticed that the water was now full of ripples, making the reflections in the water wavy and distorted. I remember the day John O'Connor brought a really old mirror into class, recalled Jack. It was his grandmother's mirror, and we couldn't see ourselves that well in it. Mr. Benson compared it to a modern mirror, the back of which was coated with a silvery material. The modern mirror could reflect almost all the light that hit it. Yes, said Samuel, and Mr. Benson told us that most mirrors have flat surfaces. They're called plane mirrors, P-L-A-N-E, mirrors. Mr. Benson also told us about two types of of mirrors that are curved surfaces instead of flat, plain surfaces. Concave and convex. So three shapes of mirrors. Plain mirror is flat, concave, dented in like a cave, and convex, dented out and curved out. Oh, I remember, said Jack. We had to draw two portraits of ourselves. One portrait was a concave image and the other was a convex image. I remember that I borrowed my mother's silver spoons and brought them to school. That's right, exclaimed Samuel excitedly. That experiment was a lot of fun. Jack went on. Now, let me see. Concave and convex mirrors reflect light in such a way that they alter or change the view we see in them. A concave mirror curves inward and produces a smaller upside down image of an object, but only if it's a certain distance away from the viewer. Yes, said Samuel, but if an object is very close to a concave mirror, its reflection will be upright and magnified. Wow, do you remember how Mr. Benson showed us how you could put a pencil point right up into the cave of the spoon and see it upright and magnified? Jack nodded and continued. Convex mirrors curve outward and always produce a smaller upright image as when you look into the convex side of the spoon. Samuel laughed out loud. Did you actually learn something in school, Jack Audire? I seem to recall that you were always talking, especially when Mr. Benson was talking. Uh, I learned a thing or two, protested Jack, and I'll have you know. Suddenly Jack leapt out of his chair, jumping jelly beans. I think I've caught a fish, he yelled. Almost at once, Jack began to wrestle with his fishing pole. It's a big one, Samuel, screeched Jack as he struggled to hold onto his fishing pole and not fall headfirst into the river. If you stand still, you'll stand a better chance of reeling it in, advised Samuel. Stand still, stand still, shrieked Jack as he battled with the creature on the end of the line. This fish is the size of a whale. How am I supposed to stand still? Do you think his fish is really the size of a whale? No, he's exaggerating, isn't he? For several minutes, Jack appeared to do a dance on the end of the pier with his fishing pole. Finally, Samuel had a good sense to take a closer look at the creature that Jack was attempting to catch. Hold on a minute, Jack. Stop wrestling with that line. You've hooked Alfie by the collar. The poor dog is trying to free himself, and you keep trying to reel him in, laughed Samuel. That darn dog should be banned from coming fishing with us. He's more trouble than he's worth, roared Jack. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get my camera, shouted Samuel. I want to get a photograph of the day, Jack. Adire hooked himself a live Springer Spaniel. (laughs) Moments later, having been unhooked by Jack, an extremely wet Alfie stood happily wagging his tail beside Jack while Samuel busied himself taking photographs of the two of them. Get away from me, you darn dog, muttered Jack as Alfie shook himself dry. Samuel laughed aloud as he continued to capture photographic images of his two best friends. If you don't put that camera away right now, you'll be as wet as that silly dog, announced Jack. 
Okay, laughed Samuel. Time for lunch, I think. The two friends shared some chicken and coleslaw while Alfie lay in the sun to finish drying off. I'm glad I had my camera with me, Samuel said between mouthfuls as he arranged the parts of his camera on the picnic blanket. Did you know that some cameras contain plain mirrors that make it possible to see the image you're about to photograph? Yeah, well, you certainly didn't need to record that image of me hooking Alfie, grumbled Jack, offering a piece of chicken to Alfie. Samuel laughed as he began to pack up the picnic basket. Well, you've obviously forgiven him. Did I tell you that we're taking Amy to the fair tomorrow? We? exclaimed Jack. Yep, that was the deal, exclaimed Samuel. I told her that if she made me some chocolate cake, I'd take her to the fair. Me too, shouted Jack, a little less grumpily. You're going to eat some cake, aren't you? Samuel yelled back. Well, okay then. But you're not going to make me go on those bumper cars again, are you? asked Jack. <laughs> no, this time I thought we would try the House of Mirrors. <laughs> so let's talk about what the setting of this story is. <clears throat> the setting is the summer in the state of New York along the Hudson River. Summer is when a story takes place. That's part of the setting. And where is the other part of a setting? So summer is when state of New York along the Hudson River is where. And from what point of view is this story being told? It's being told in the third person by a narrator who can sort of see everything that's going on with all the characters at the same time. How do you know that this is a third person narrator? Well, the pronouns that are being used in this section are words he, his, and him instead of I, mine, my, and me. You heard Samuel explain to Jack that when rays of light waves hit an object, they can be transmitted, reflected, or absorbed. What do these terms mean? Well, when light hits an object and passes through it, it is transmitted. When light hits an object and bounces off of it, it is reflected and creates a reflection. When light hits an object and is soaked up into it, it is absorbed and a shadow is created behind the object. Transmitted, reflected, absorbed. What causes light to reflect off water, glass, and other smooth and shiny surfaces? Well, rays of light waves hit all parts of smooth, shiny objects at the same angle and are then reflected off them at the same angle, creating a clear reflection. Why can't you see your reflection in a rough surface like a piece of wood? Well, light rays hit different parts of the wood and many of them are absorbed. They don't reflect back at the same angle, so there is not a reflection. What is a mirror? A mirror is a smooth, polished surface like glass that reflects light and produces an image. You heard Samuel tell Jack that there are three types of mirrors, plain, convex, and concave. How would you describe each one? A plane mirror is flat and accurate. A concave mirror is curved inward like a cave. And a convex mirror is curved outward toward you. Based on the information in the story so far, why do you think Samuel wants to visit the House of Mirrors? Well, Samuel is very interested in, the, in this extraordinary science of light and the important part that it plays in his art. He has already explained what causes light to reflect off 
smooth, shiny surfaces. And by visiting the House of Mirrors, he will be able to demonstrate to Jack and the children that are coming along with him the different ways that mirrors um, of various designs reflect light. You heard Jack tell Samuel, this fish is the size of a whale. What does this descriptive statement make you think about Jack's character? Does it make the story and or the character more dramatic or humorous? Yeah, words that help the reader to visualize or see a scene help us to know more about what's going on in the story. By Jack saying that the fish is as big as a whale, the reader knows that there is something very large or heavy on the end of Jack's fishing line. Because it's unlikely to be a whale, that makes Jack's words kind of funny. The author's making a point also that Jack has a tendency to exaggerate. Okay. If you exaggerate a whole lot, we call it hyperbole, which is exaggerating so much it could never, ever, ever be true. Can you look around where you are sitting right now, either in the classroom or at home? And are there any items in the classroom or at home that are reflective? Reflective items produce reflections, accurate representations. They would have a smooth, shiny surface. Even some of the boards around the classroom have sort of a reflection. We have glass windows that if you're sitting at the right angle, there's a reflection. We also have some plexiglass dividers that are providing a reflection. So there are several items in our classroom. Okay. Um, concave and convex, okay? Um, they are words that describe curved surfaces rather than flat surfaces. If you are looking at something concave, it's bent inward. Think of a cave, you can walk into a cave. If you're talking about something that is convex, it curves outward. So every morning I pour my cereal into a concave bowl. If I turn my bowl upside down, the outside that's now facing me is convex. Please don't try to pour your cereal or milk into a convex bowl because it will end up dribbling all over the counter or the table and eventually on the floor. Can you see anything in the classroom that's concave or convex? Okay, if you see a dent in the car, is that concave or convex? That's concave. If you see a dome and you're looking at it from the outside, is that concave or convex? That is convex. If you're standing inside a dome, like in a large building, and you look up at it from the inside, is it concave or convex? That would be concave. The Roman Colosseum, looking down into it, is that concave or convex? It would be concave. Any large Colosseum, if you're looking down on it and it doesn't have a roof on it, would be concave. If you have a bowl and it's sitting on the table and you're looking into it, is that concave or convex? Concave. If you take that same bowl and you turn it upside down and you look down at it, it's now convex. You're right. If you look at the rounded top of a light bulb, convex or concave? Convex. That's right. Good work.